So it's always difficult to follow <laughs> the keynote speakers as the next speaker. I'm not going to have as elegant a talk as either one of these guys, I don't think. But I, um, I'm actually a biochemist and molecular biologist by training. And I, I went to Johns Hopkins, like was said. So I, I am interested in the biomedical applications of nanotechnology. But similar to Dr. Musa, I think, I sort of got out of industry um, around the time nanotechnology was really started to take off. And I also realized that my passion really was working with students. And um, yeah, so I should put a plug in for K-State. Um, uh, we're the only nanotechnology center of excellence um, that has, was strategically housed in a college of veterinary medicine. And um, I moved to K-State in 2014 because I knew that to really progress nanomedicine, you have to study nanoparticles in animals. And um, I will also say that the corridor between Kansas City, KU, and K-State is um, nationally, soon we're going to have relocating um, the National Bio and Agro Defense Center right next door to the vet school, which is going to place us in a pretty unparalleled research environment. So I'm, um, I'm hoping to train many, many graduate students in the time that I actually have left. Right, so I think we're approaching biomedical nanotechnology, and in particular, the grant I have right now is from the National Cancer Institute, so I'm really interested in anti-cancer applications, but we approach it maybe from a little bit of a unique domain or area that as I'm pretty fascinated um, by yeah, a nanomaterial meets an RNA molecule, or a nanomaterial meets a protein molecule, and then what happens? What happens to, right, I mean, cells at the fundamental level are controlled by proteins, and, and more recently we're discovering many types of functions for RNA. And as Dr. Musa said, the, exposure, the environmental, nano is happening. And it's actually maybe kind of scary that we actually do not, for the most part, know very much at all about how nanomaterials essentially impact protein and RNA structure function. Um, by the way, that's a huge research opportunity. Yeah? So, I'm actually gonna mostly, I do have collaborators that make nanomaterials for me, thankfully. I'm not really a synthesis guy though. I'm more interested in kind of, whoop, I'm more interested in kind of studying the interaction between RNA and proteins and the functional effects. And of course, I do, our, our group does do a bit of drug delivery, mostly RNA and um, protein delivery, but but really as a biochemist molecular biologist this is kind of a really big gap in our understanding we're trying to we're trying to break that down so i <laughs> yeah i'm 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 a biochemist so there's an awful lot of materials here and pretty much nanomaterials are being made out of every single one of these right and i kind of to my students i liken this to animals at the zoo like a giraffe is an awful lot different than a black panther. That is, right, these nanomaterials, each and every one of them are going to have unique properties. Okay? Once again, the immeasurable opportunity that nanotechnology provides, I think, is pretty exciting. That said, uh, I had to, okay, so I, have, I don't have 350 patents, but I do have a few. And most of them centered around gold, 
and the interaction between gold particles and DNA vaccines and proteins, okay, and how you can use that for delivery. But I am a biochemist, and actually gold is not naturally present in our cells and tissues in our bodies. So I've really been kind of curious with these guys up here because as an element, as an atom, as an ion in cells and tissues, these guys here, zinc, copper, iron, are the kinds of materials that actually mediate protein and RNA interactions <coughs> and stability. So in my stupid head, I got to wondering, hey, if those are the kinds of elements and atoms that are mediating protein and RNA interactions in cells and tissues, what do they do as a nanomaterial? Do they even interact with proteins and RNA? What's the functional effect of, say, cobalt or cobalt oxide that we study interacting with an RNA? And that's kind of the approach we take. It's maybe a little bit different. Dr. Musa aptly pointed out one of the really exciting things uh, that's kind of new and having an impact already um, is essentially cancer immunotherapy, okay? And what's really interesting, this is actually, I've kind of cut and pasted this out of the article that we've most recently got accepted in this journal called the Wiley Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Reviews in Nanomedicine and Nanobiotechnology. What's really interesting is if you look, if you survey the literature for people that have looked at immunological effects, you know, you might think that some of these materials like silicon, calcium phosphate, are bioinert, when in fact there's a growing body of evidence which suggests that these are immunologically active. And so you get to thinking, hey, you know, if I could combine a nanoparticle that elicits uh, interleukin-6 and, and, and get that to a tumor with an RNA that could knock down uh, tum tumor necrosis factor, this just for example. You know, you could think about actually having essentially a combination chemoimmunotherapy and having someone who since his PhD days has been after the cure for cancer, that's going to take us an awful lot closer to the end goal by combining chemo and immunotherapy, okay? And so we're kind of, yeah, we're kind of locking in on a couple of these chemistries that we think are interesting because, you know, you can only show a little bit of data up here, but we've been playing with these nanomaterials essentially basically since I came out of industry, cooking them up with proteins and cooking them up with RNA and trying to figure out what they do. And, you know, I kind of have my, my top 10 list or my favorite list, and um, so I kind of am biased. I'm going to tell you right now, we've been kind of focusing on zinc oxide and more recently on cobalt oxide, um, but I have to give due to lots of other folks, that, and these are interesting too, the iron oxides for, for various reasons. Calcium phosphate is uh, very interesting too, and silicon, of course. But we're, I'm a little bit biased. I'm going to say that we're kind of mostly focused on this guy and another guy, and one that's a little bit more like graphene that we've gotten onto recently, I'm going to talk about hopefully at the end. It's called boron carbide, which has got really very unique uh, you know, bio interface properties. I didn't time this out as I usually do, so yeah, tell me if I'm over time here. Um, but I can kind of step it up. I'm not a nano guy, but I have some crazy nanochemist collaborators that come up with these, you know, garage band contraptions that make nanoparticles for me. And, and it's not so crazy because, you know, one of my great friends and collaborators actually has been making nanomaterials for the Army for, for more than a decade. And so I don't make them, I just get them and use them from these guys. But they do have some really neat techniques and technologies for making the nanomaterials. Another collaborator I have has um, been working on different ways to make cobalt oxide. And like Dr. Musa again aptly said, the RNA could be a, probably the greatest class of therapeutic ever, really. Um, the problem is it's also the most unstable <laughs> biomolecule, right? And a couple of years ago in the literature, there was a report that a person made mesoporous silica. 
And by doing, having these little nooks and crannies in the nanoparticle, when they cooked the RNA up with that nanoparticle, they were able to stabilize the RNA. So I said to my good collaborator, Dr. Juan Kay, I said, you have to make us mesoporous cobalt oxide. If you can do that, we're going to actually have something. So he just presented this work. I borrowed one of his slides at the American Chemical Society. But he's kind of done that. They're a little bit too big, probably, to get in cancer cells right now. So we're going to have to make them a little bit smaller. But, but we're getting there. And it's definitely going, be, definitely going to be very interesting in terms of its RNA interaction and delivery potential. The other thing I have this great, my, probably my best long time player is Dr. Gosh, Dr. Karti Gosh. And he's best known for characterizing um, zinc oxide. And he has the first paper on using Raman spectroscopy. We actually see direct RNA interactions between zinc oxide. As you know, from an industrial standpoint, you, if you have to surface functionalize your nanoparticle, it complicates your process. You can do it. It will work. And there are those things in the, in the clinic. But if you could actually get a direct RNA interaction with zinc oxide, you might could streamline your downstream process, process, if that makes sense. So kind of having done that before, I'm trying to look at things that are directly RNA interacting, directly RNA stabilizing. So by Ramon, you can kind of see how the RNA, ATP, believe it or not, is an RNA molecule. Everybody wants ATP, the energy molecule in the cells. ATP is an RNA molecule, so it's a fundamental RNA molecule. We use ATP. We use Ramon to kind of figure out how the zinc oxide was actually interacting with the ATP. As it turns out, it interacts both with the phosphate, but also, interestingly <coughs> enough, from the base of the ATP, the adenosine or adenine base, is making contacts with zinc oxide. So we do think, we're pretty confident now that zinc oxide actually interacts with RNA directly. That's been published. OK. Um, Right, so we, a nanoparticle, I don't care what it's made out of, it interacts with an RNA, right? Proteins have to fold up to have their activity. I guarantee you, probably multiple Nobel Prizes will be awarded to the person who figures out the complexity of actually the RNA structures that are available in cells and tissues, okay? That's a wide open kind of black box, if you will. How do we study that? So. Uh, can we turn the lights down possibly in this room? Thank you so much. Okay. So one way you can kind of, AFM is, is uh, beautiful in terms of visualizing uh, macromolecules with a nanoparticle, for example. Time force microscopy, everything else. Okay. The problem is it's not quantitative. Yeah? You can see the complex. You can see the interaction. It's beautiful. It's a piece of lambda phage DNA wrapped around the dendromer, basically. Okay. Another instrument that's kind of got popular in the last couple of years is a nanocyte, a nanoparticle tracking analysis, NTA. So we're just a cobalt and polyanic polymer polymers. These guys actually will complex to form a near nano complex, depending on what the definition of nano is. And I'm kind of in Dr. Muse's book. I think that if it's useful, we can even extend that x-axis a bit. Yeah. But we can actually, it's beautiful. Basically, the way this thing, it detects individual particles, the way the NTA works. And it's, each one of these blue blips is actually part of the population of guys when these guys complex, yeah. But the majority of them are in this range here. And actually, these have anti-cancer properties. We already published that. So you can use nanotracking analysis, NTA, as a way to uh, study interaction between RNA and nanoparticles, if you will. Of course, the kind of classic way that people have studied um, structural changes in proteins, uh, if there's a destabilization that occurs, uh, is through a technique called circular dichroism. You don't really need to know. It's essentially, it's not bended light, but it's polarized light. And the polarized light goes to a test tube. If a biomolecule has any kind of racemic thing, sort of kind of um, stereochemistry associated with proteins do, you'll get a unique um, spectral pattern of protein, or in our case, RNA. You can see that there is some structural alteration in the RNA when it contacts zinc oxide. So, yeah, so we're kind of, the group is, part of our interest is, is new characterization methods for studying how RNA and protein interact with nanoparticles. Miranda and the group actually is going to give a talk um, tomorrow. We, we actually have a patent, a patent um, submitted using what we call two-dimensional fluorescence difference spectroscopy for detecting that. And Miranda's going to give a talk directed to that tomorrow afternoon, I think. OK, but as a biochemist, 
the end of the day, cancers, or cancer cells, all cells really, <coughs> biochemically are controlled by enzymes that catalyze all the reactions that are important for life. And so the question then becomes, hey, you have a nanoparticle. Uh, again, I don't really care what it's made of. We kind of are, we have our favorites again. <laughs> Um, it hits a protein, and what happens? Well, for many years we've been doing, you know, bioengineering mutation studies, trying to create super proteins. Okay, and it takes a lot of time. You've got to make the correct amino acid replacement or substitution in order to get a super active protein or a super stable protein or any other number. Yeah, but you might be if we understood this, we understood the nanobio interface. It might be that we could marry a nanoparticle with its protein, right, and achieve things that we might like to achieve. Achieve things that drugs actually achieve. Inhibiting enzymes, activating them, uh, making them more stable chemically and thermally. And so kind of we've been playing that game a little bit too. So the cancer, I'm actually interested in pancreatic cancer. I, I worked on that as a postdoc. But the uh, you know melanoma, skin cancer is accessible. I can put nanoparticles on there. Put our name with nanoparticles on there. So originally we've kind of been going after melanoma, and I also worked in my postdoc for kind of one of the world experts in, in signaling, cancer signaling. And so we kind of have figured out now actually the important signaling patterns for melanoma. Okay, so we can start talking about maybe multifunctional nanoparticles, which load and deliver uh, peptides or RNA molecules that are designed to intercede these pathways that melanoma, okay, uses to progress and to mass metastasize. Are you guys following this? Because I know it's a very diverse audience. Hopefully, I don't know. Maybe I'll try to, yeah, so these are essentially many cancers for the can things that cancer you know grow divide many can cancers use these pathways and the critical proteins that are in there to become cancerous yeah so we're kind of targeting a few of the guys that are important here RAF, ERK, AKT in, in melanoma I'm actually not going to be able to talk about that because we don't quite have a post yet but we will soon however suffice it to say we need a model system right model systems, to be able to study how nanoparticles affect enzyme biochemistry, essentially, at the end of the day, okay? And probably the best one, if you guys know the firefly in the summertime, the firefly tail glows, it luminesces, okay, photoluminesces, based upon a biochemical reaction, it's an enzyme called luciferase, we shortened the loop, yeah, that produces light. If you put ATP in there and you give it substrate luciferin, it produces light. Light is super sensitive, so functionally you can determine, hey, if I give this enzyme in a test tube a nickel oxide nanoparticle, how does it affect the enzyme function? And some nanoparticles can pump it up. And some nanoparticles, we believe because they have a very unique nanobio interface, are able to completely ablate the enzyme activity of that enzyme, i.e. functioning with the drug. So we've kind of gotten really interested here lately in this boron carbide, and I'm just gonna say there's about three publications in the literature on boron carbide, and none of them have anything to do with enzyme biochemistry or um, delivery of molecules into cancer cells. Let's put it that way. Okay. So yes, I want to do more stuff in animals. That's why I moved to a vet school. Yeah, it's difficult to do high throughput chemistry in animals, however. But what we can do is we can grow these artificial tumors. This is a thing um, lately here called spheroids. Have you guys ever heard of spheroids? There's three-dimensional structures. Three -dimensional, they're, they're artificial tumor-like structures. Yeah. And so we've been growing these tumor spheroids. And basically, we've been salt and pepper nanoparticles on them. Pretty basic stuff, but if you want to kill a tumor, and if we have these anti-cancer nanoparticles, what happens to these three structures when you do that? And so what will happen is if you let these guys go, they start to make the satellite colonies. And the thing one is, you know, nanoparticles not, don't necessarily have to get on, <coughs> in, or around these structures. Well, actually, they do. 
not all. In some, there's clearly some aggregates, and that could maybe be dealt with by surface functionalization, but surely, or clearly, some of these nanoparticles actually do associate with these 3D tumors. And we kind of think they're actually getting into the tumors, and I can't show you any data we don't have a post yet, but suffice to say, we're developing nanoparticles that will go into these structures, um, and now it's just a matter of tapping into some of their other properties to actually see them. I don't know why I keep coming back to Boyden because I can change. That's been, that's been published. The other thing we're really interested in um, is, right, chemotherapy, you know, it's barbaric. It's basic. I hope none of us, right, we, we do our loved ones, you know, cancer is devastating as that one slide shows. We haven't made much progress. And one of the things that chemotherapy with nanotechnology can do is make it more specific than cancer cells. So, We've kind of been asking this question, hey, if nanoparticles get into cancer cells and they seem to be affecting these enzymes that at the end of the day are making the cancer cell more cancerous, then maybe there's, maybe this is not too big of a leap to suggest that maybe nanoparticles themselves may have anti-cancer specificity. If you load an equal amount of nanoparticle, boron carbide or zinc oxide, onto a quote, normal cell, now when you grow cells in puncture, maybe not so normal, but miles nih 3 t 3 cells are often used for control cells. You put those on, nanoparticles on those guys, you put them on a human melanoma cell, it's a 375 line, it's the class of one that people use. And you can see that like 80 to 90% of them, if this is the, the air bubbles here, would be dead. But in the normal cell case, you know, 50% of them would be dead. There's not a range of cell activity However, for some nanoparticles, we're getting better, actually. And so then you talk about, you can start loading um, chemotherapy agents on there so that this guy, okay, this guy's leaving the normal cells like completely alone, which it's not, but there are better. And then you load it with, an, um, right? It's already killing 50% of the cancer cells. You load that with a drug, and hopefully you can increase that margin of selectivity. Yeah? How much time? Five minutes. Five minutes? Sweet. Thanks. Okay. So we've been interested in uh, characterizing this, the RNA or the protein in the nanobiomarkage and how um, they affect protein. And I didn't get a chance to really talk about, we're just starting how they affect RNA function too. But So but the, the end of the day in a cell, Actually, we already have nanomachines in cells. You know what they're called? Ribosomes, spliceosomes, replication complexes, so nanomachines. And really, the ribosome is responsible for translating every single protein in every single cell in our bodies, or any other organ's bodies for that matter, right? That's a nanomachine. And there's this big black box. How does a nanoparticle goes into a cell? And uh, there's a nanomachine there responsible for every cell being translated into proteins called a ribosome. So the fundamental question that I don't believe anybody has addressed yet is how do nanoparticles affect protein-RNA interactions or protein-RNA structures? Okay, so how do you tackle that problem? I'm gonna go ahead. Um, a couple years ago, my graduate student, we, we reported this method for essentially measuring, we engineered a spliceosome in a way, we engineered luciferase, and we could turn that luciferase on by delivering to the cancer cell an oligonucleotide that could correct the cryptic splicing so that the luciferase, a functional luciferase gets expressed in the cancer cell. And the only way that can happen is if we deliver this oligonucleotide that attacks, that, that blocks this cryptic splicing site, okay? And we showed, you know, by PC, RT PCR that you can correct the product. We showed by the you doing the luciferase reaction essentially on these cells that they produce photoluminescence after you deliver that oligonucleotide to them. So we actually now have a model system to test whether or not uh, nanoparticles affect splicing, which is other than probably ribosome, probably the most important nanomachine in terms of molecular biology and gene editing and gene function. 
All right, so uh, let me back up since I've got a couple more minutes left, just to give a little plug for what Rand's going to talk about tomorrow. So what are the methods that we have right now for detecting protein RNA interactions? Well, the classic one, if you're a molecular biologist, you probably did this, I don't know about in high school, but maybe if you took a biotech class, it's called gel after freezes. And so we have an RNA that we study that's called poly-IC. It doesn't really matter. RNA is going to run in the negative direction, right? Protonine, this protein that we study that's cation, is going to run in the positive direction. It's positive, so it runs in the negative direction. Vice versa, the RNA is negative, so it runs in the positive direction. So when you complex the two, you get a gel shift, yeah? And so then you start to ask the question, well, if I add zinc oxide nanoparticles here, for example, what happens to this RNA complex? And, and here's what happens. If you add boron carbide nanoparticles, ain't nothing there. How do you explain that? You can see why I've lost a lot of hair the last couple of years. So we don't know. And that's a fundamental question I think at the end of the day is exciting but scary. How, how if nanoparticles get into cells, which they do, cells at the end of the day are being controlled and regulated through RNA protein complexes. What happens to them? Okay? A classic way you can measure this is by a potential shift and a potential if there's an interaction. <coughs> but Rand's going to talk about tomorrow. Many nanoparticles um, right, have light producing properties, and you can, you, can, you can use the shift in the light producing properties to kind of quantify, if you will, one, if, if there's an interaction, and, and two, maybe how, how powerful the interaction is. Or, quantify that bioelectric interactions at the nanoparticle surface. All right, so I think if we can just possibly not die from cancer, as sinister as that sounds, for the next five, 10 years, we're going to, that curve is going to steepify, steepen like you would not believe. And the reason is because we've never had materials that can act the level of molecular signaling pathways and RNA protein complexes before like nanomaterials can. And so what we really would like to do, and we also kind of understand, each cancer is different. The proteins and the RNAs that are off, up and down in each cancer is different, but we can sequence these things, we can figure it out, and pretty soon you can walk into a clinic and you're gonna be able to have a profile. And so what we need to do to catch up is we have to figure out what nanoparticles can basically load proteins and RNA that can attack those different nodes of each different cancer, if that makes sense. So we have to create stop and go signals. We have to reprogram the cancer cell by putting back into them the things that will correct or in the case of turning things off like sRNA, as you guys know, that there will be a place for that as well. All right, so um, this is a group we had the year before I left for K-State. This is our current group. Two of whom were able to come with me, um, which is great. We'll have a poster and talk tomorrow. And uh, yeah, I'd like to, I have a little bit of support from, from all of these Asian states and a lot of support both from my students and <coughs> a relatively short, but I'd like to extend a list of very dedicated collaborators with whom I'm working on.